I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels like nothing short of the violent rush of the Holy Spirit with tongues of fire will be able to create some semblance of unity in our country, in our world. If there's something we can disagree about, if there's something we can use to create division, if there's a difference to highlight or bemoan, we're on it. Often seen division where it doesn't even exist. I stopped by the men's group on Thursday morning. We ended up in a conversation that I told them, gave me the direction for my sermon, and they better all show up and worship. <laughs> they did at the first service. The one said that the 11 o'clock worship service last Sunday, led mostly by our Sunday school young people, was so great that everyone should have experienced it. And that was great and beautiful and all about the joy to share. But then he said, then he said, he had the radical idea that we should go to one service at 9 a.m. and be one church instead of two. <laughs> I said, we are not two churches. Which then leads me to today's Pentecost question, if you heard it, and I should have asked, what does that mean? Do we have to be in the same place at the same time to be one? Which, of course, is right away a challenge because we have people listening in on the radio at the first service, and we have people tuning in at different times from different places on live stream, sometimes not even until Wednesday or Thursday. And does not church happen at Ursa Minor among the young adults every other Thursday evening? Ah, amen. And doesn't church happen at confirmation and middle school gatherings on Sunday night? Okay, come on, Joey, you gotta say yes. Okay. And then there's the big one. Do we have to listen to and sing and like the same music to be one? That's a no there, I hope. What makes for unity? What is oneness based upon? When we try to create unity, we usually want people to be like us. We create oneness based on our own preferences. Even if we don't think this way, our actions reveal how often we create community based on similarity. We gather with those who like the same music, with those who like to do the same thing, with those who have the same viewpoint, those who like to read the same books, those who believe the same things, those who play the same sport, those who root for the same teams, which you understand is why I'm very lonely with my Eagles support. <laughs> it's not too far a stretch to end up creating community based on economic status, the geographical area we come from, the language we speak. How many churches have that origin based in language? Our age or the color of our skin? There are reasons for and often nothing wrong with these communities. I just, we need our support groups. I just found somebody in Superior who roots for the Eagles. I have a friend. We seek out support groups, and often they are people who are like us, understand us, help us feel not alone. And the Spirit may well be active in those groups. But the Spirit of Pentecost, the Spirit that Jesus told the disciples to wait in the city until they are clothed with power from on high, the Spirit we profess makes claim upon Mary and Todd in his baptism today, this is the radical spirit that takes our human communities and jumbles them all together to create something new, to create a community in which diversity is its most notable attribute. People from all over who speak in different language, but all being in the spirit, they can understand one another. The miracle of the Pentecost story in Acts. 
Our oneness is not any of our human attributes. It is not of our own making. It is not based in being, it is based instead on being gathered together around one bread, becoming one body, filled with one spirit for the purposes of being witnesses to the one Lord whose power and love we know through Jesus Christ. So there are two responses to the Spirit's entrance in the Acts Pentecost reading. I don't know if you picked those up. Two different responses. One is a question of curiosity, of wonder, of seeking understanding. What does this mean? The second is one of sneering dismissal. They're drunk on new wine. Think about how many times we are given the opportunity to step into another's life or learn something new, but instead of asking, what does this mean? Tell me more. We allow the conversation to trail off or we close it down. How readily we dismiss someone or a group of people or a new idea with the flick of a wrist with a biting comment. Because if we can dismiss someone or something, then we can ignore it. Then we don't have to deal with it. Then we don't have to change. How often we disregard what people have to say if it disagrees with what we think or it hits too close to home or it's threatening or scary or, or sometimes we just don't want to know. But the Spirit is on the move to help people from all over understand one another. That first Pentecost, some of those watching, overhearing, were led to wanting to know more. What does this mean? I suggested at Bible study on Friday, we all put this question, I think I'll have these ready for you next week. We all put this question on a card and keep it in our pocket before we say something dismissive of someone or some new idea or some suggestion. We can pull out the card and go, oh, tell me more. We have difficulty with this in our own families, in our faith communities. Parents are notorious for dismissing our kids' ideas before asking, tell me more. Our son Pear just got his umpteenth tattoo, right? I have to go, tell me more. <laughs> How will we ever understand those who have many other perceived differences if we can't stop to understand our own kids or fellow worshipers? How will we be able to hear about the issues Robert Jones talked about on Wednesday night, issues like the doctrine of discovery, the racism inherent in our beautiful and yet flawed and practiced faith, Christian nationalism? This winter, when we were talking about other faiths at confirmation, one of our confirmation kids said, we have to be willing to be changed. That is a remarkable thing for a 14, 15 year old to say. We have to be willing to be changed. I asked, where did you learn that? From life. <laughs> I think it wasn't Joey, so I'm not blocking you out. Um, Joey says many wise things, but, and wise cracker things also. But, um, notice he didn't give any, this boy didn't give any credit to his parents. You know, that's how it goes. That's what Marion will do to you as he gets older. Okay. To really listen to someone, to really seek understanding, is to be willing to be changed. This is the work of community building. It doesn't automatically happen. Short of the spirit blowing through like that first Pentecost, community building takes place one person at a time. It is a practice based on the discipline of asking questions 
and refraining from dismissing those ideas that are anathema to our own understandings and desires. It starts one conversation, one relationship at a time. It starts with stepping outside of our comfort zone, or as was said Wednesday night, being willing to sit with our discomfort rather than flee or go on the defensive or go on the attack. I know it does sometimes feel it will be nothing short of a sound like the rush of a violent wind blowing in and divided tongues of fire resting upon each of us, filling us with the Holy Spirit so that we can understand one another's language. And though that would amaze and astonish and scare us, I think it might be less frightening than the actual hard work of community building. Many of you know that I, along with 14 other community members in Philadelphia, started the charter school, the Wissahick and Charter School, an envir environmentally based curriculum. They expanded to another school building a while ago because the waiting list was so long. It says on their webpage, two campuses, one community. Kind of like us, right? Two services, one community. That's going right on to our webpage. <laughs> one of the school's core tenets is community building. Every day, each classroom takes time learning to listen and share, to talk through conflict. I remember Kai's fourth grade teacher, Miss Jackie, telling me that during morning circle community building time, one girl talked about the musical The Wiz that they had just put on, and our son Kai dismissed it, saying that was lame. The girl said I was in it. But Jackie told me later in the day, she saw Kai go over to that girl, and she heard him say, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were in it. I bet you worked really hard, and I bet you were really good. Community is risky business, community building. It's risky, it's hard work, we make mistakes, we dismiss rather than take out the card and ask, tell me more. The question is, can we catch ourselves? Can we apologize? Try again. When we dismiss people and things and understandings, we create distance. When we wonder and ask questions, we take things into ourselves, and we might just, as our confirmation students suggested, be changed. Building community is not trying to create things in our own image, but to see in others the unifying image, the one we all have been created in, the image of God. It turns out unity is already a given. The spirit it is what moves us to listen for it and to see it and to act on that. In Jesus' name, amen.